lecture is going to be given to us today by uh, Dr. Martina Absenta, um, a clinician scientist with a PhD in molecular medicine. Uh, she worked under Daniel Reichs um, with 7T uh, MRI uh, neuropathology correlations. More recently, she's established her own research group in Sa um, San Raffaele University in Milan in Italy with um, concentration on the clinical relevance of chronic inflammation and chronic active lesions driving clinical progression in MS, which is what I was uh, alluding to. And she's developed some new techniques to help her do that and develop a uh, means to look at single cell uh, processes involved in that. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, hearing your talk, uh, Martina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction, and I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. Thank you, and sorry for the delay, but it was not my fault, unfortunately. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's start uh, my disclosures. I would like to start this talk showing you a time-lapse MRI of a patient. This patient was running at age 30. It was a uh, uh, wheelchair-bound age 54, and uh, this is like 24 years of MS. Let's see if it's working, yeah. So you can see the high inflammatory nature of this disease with many appearing areas in flame. After um, contrast enhancement, this means that there is an opening of a bulbar barrier lesion onset, but you see also over time the enlargement of the ventricles, suggesting atrophy, the suicide. Um, however, we know that a proportion of our patients experience disability and um, uh, progression independent of the occurrence of new lesions, so these inflammatory lesions and new relapses. So we need uh, um, uh, to look for something related to the non-relapsing biology in MS in order to better understand progression, in order to uh, prevent, if possible, or limit progression and accumulation of clinical disability. So one uh, candidate uh, for this uh, non-relapsing biology in MS is the compartmentalized inflammation, so chronic inflammation with the central nervous system. And we know, it's not working, and you know, uh, we know that uh, a chronic inflammation can be seen at the level of the chronic active lesions or zone expanding lesions, but also at the, uh, in the leptomeninges, cortical lesions, cortical pathology, but also in the spinal cord, and everything should be uh, always keep in mind that everything is in the context of an aging brain. So uh, some uh, progress has been made in imaging the chronic active lesions, and uh, this is the topic of my talk and my work. So uh, the chronic active lesions are just one type of chronic MS lesions. So after the lesion formation, lesions are becoming chronic, so at the closure of the barrier, and the chronic active lesions are just one type of them. On the other uh, uh, end of the spectrum, we have the remarinated uh, lesions or shadow plaques on pathology with some uh, um, attempt to repair and thin myon layers covering the naked axon after the inflammatory uh, demarination. Uh, we have the chronic inactive lesions uh, that are uh, indeed uh, demarinated, but without many inflammatory cells. These lesions are burned out, let's say. Uh, but the most interesting to me at least are these chronic active lesions that are demarinated, but with this uh, uh, peculiar feature, this <laughs> dense iron-laden inflammatory infiltrate at the lesion edge, as you can see here in this picture. And uh, um, in two big autopsy studies, it's been estimated about 30% of plaques autopsy and a little bit uh, prevalent in progressive uh, MS. So until recently, it was not possible to distinguish, uh, at least in vivo, with MRI, these different subtypes of chronic, uh, chronic lesions. But Game Changer was the use of 7 Tesla about 10 years ago, and these are susceptibility-based uh, MRI sequences. And what, what we can, in, because we can see directly this type of macroscopic pathology. And this is because the ion within the inflammatory infiltrate at the lesion edge is strongly paramagnetic and so can be easily seen by these uh, uh, susceptibility based MRI uh, techniques. And now we have an imaging biomarker that is this paramagnetic rim lesion because now this dark rim edge is exactly what uh, has been shown in pathology um, in the chronic active lesions. So in the last 10 years, uh, 11 so far, MRI pathological studies have uh, validated these imaging biomarkers so that these paramagnetic rim lesions uh, identify at least a subset of chronic active lesions. 
and uh, uh, there is also one uh, um, um, MRI PET, pathological PET study, uh, cross-confirming uh, uh, that uh, uh, these chronic active lesions, PRL, are also positive for uh, TSPO. Um, using both seven Tesla and now also three Tesla MRI, so we can see also three Tesla, this type of uh, um, uh, lesions, um, we uh, can do, uh, can look for, you know, core population uh, far um, in, in larger population than autopsy studies, of course. And these are data pulled from 31 published MRI studies, so three Tesla and seven Tesla studies. And so from these studies, uh, it's becoming quite clear that paramagnetic rim lesions are specific and um, of MS, uh, cannot be seen in other um, mimicking disorders. The only exception is the Susax uh, syndrome, in which you can see sometimes some lesions in the corpus callosum resembling uh, a um, paramagnetic rim lesion, although there are other features that are pretty much different from an imaging point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, but not in the other mimics, such as uh, the NMOs uh, and the other inflammatory neurological disorder and so on and so forth. But the other thing important is that uh, these paramagnetic rim lesions are also frequent. About 50% of MS people, they, they have at least one of this type of lesion and can be seen in all clinical phenotypes. Uh, in the clinical isolated syndrome, relapsing remitting, progressive MS cases, but also in the radiological isolated syndrome. Um, so the progressive MS cases, they have uh, a little bit higher prevalence of uh, um, patient positive for PRLs, about 60%. And also, also in the risk, I have to say, so it will be interesting to see if they con will convert in the future into progressive MS. And uh, this is in line with the autopsy studies I've shown you early in the, in the first uh, um, slide. What was also very interesting from this uh, um, data is that the relapse in remitting MS cases having several of these uh, paramagnetic rim lesions, so several, let's say, chronic active lesions, they um, have also uh, a more aggressive clinical and radiological course. We identify cutoff of four, but it's a statistical cutoff. Can, can be, you know, uh, five maybe in other studies, but, you know, in some studies is two, but, you know, let's say that having several of these uh, um, paramagnetic rim lesions associated with uh, um, disability. And the recent studies published last month uh, with the same cutoff, they show that having more than four uh, paramagnetic rim lesion is associated with uh, um, disability after nine years. So it's a predictor of disability in the future and also uh, is associated with an increased risk of transition to progression. So overall, these data are suggesting that uh, these paramagnetic rim lesions, uh, that is the biomarker for the chronic active lesions, this is a subset, uh, is implicated somehow in progression and uh, maybe one of the factors, not the only one, of course, but one of the factors um, contributing to clinical progression and disability in MS. So, but why, you know, I, I have this question along all these years, but why having, you know, a bunch of these type of lesions is associated with disability and progression? How it is possible? And uh, mm, so, in, in the last years, we tried to answer this question. So, first of all, these lesions are very destructive and do not remyelinate. In one of the first studies we did, uh, we clearly um, saw the transition from an active lesion, uh, an active lesion here uh, with the gadolinium enhancement, you can see in the first row, and the transition from active inflammation to chronic active inflammation at the uh, closure of the global barrier. So this uh, uh, pattern is associated at year one to lesions that are larger, and uh, with a lower T1 value suggested these lesions are very destructive in comparison to those without this persistent rim after the closure of the bubble barrier. This has been further confirmed recently by a uh, uh, multiparametric tritesla study in which uh, uh, different techniques have been uh, um, used to characterize this type of lesions, so PRL versus non-PRL, and the PRL are the uh, yellow cluster, so each dot here is a um, lesion, and you can see that PRL are all together in the yellow cluster and they have low myelin water fraction and low neuride density, um, diffuse intensity. 
and so they are very destructive. The other reason is that some of these uh, paramagnetic rim lesions expand over time. So this is uh, an in vivo to post-mortem study, and you can see that uh, there are um, age 52, sort of three lesions, and then over time they are growing. This, uh, this is a progressive MS patient without any uh, gadolinium enhancing uh, lesions in the last uh, 20 years, treated with interferon beta uh, during his life. And uh, we could confirm post-mortem that this lesion was having this uh, paramagnetic rim uh, on the post-mortem 7 Tesla MRI, and also we confirmed that was, this lesion was a chronic active lesion. So um, this means that since some of these uh, uh, paramagnetic rim lesions are expanding over time, this means that periplaque is very unstable and prone to further demyelination. So this might be one reason of association of this lesion with disability. So also the spare tissue is not spare anymore because it can be affected by inflammatory demyelination. The other biomarker um, that is evaluating the lesion volume change, change over time is the um, slowly expanding lesion called cells. So I mention here because it is a biomarker is a little bit different from paramagnetic rim lesions. Uh, the cells uh, uh, implement a Jacobian determinant on conventional T1 and T2 weighted sequences, so conventional imaging. So there is no susceptibility here, there is no ion uh, microglia anywhere here. It's just uh, um, this, this biomarker is looking for uh, uh, lesion volumetric changes. And, but this is an interesting biomarker, and, and we are looking for understanding the uh, overlap between the two biomarkers. They might express different features of chronic inflammation or chronic active lesions. And so we need comparative data at this point to understand. So far, one study, preliminarily uh, not even published, show modest co-localization with the uh, paramagnetic rim lesion. The third reason is that uh, um, the paramagnetic, the chronic active lesion, you can see in path on pathology, are associated with ongoing subtle, ongoing axonal damage injury. And you can see from the first panel, because uh, um, you can see some uh, um, end bulbs uh, positive for APP, that is the amyloid precursor protein. This is happening when you have an axon is transacted, and so the transaction of the axon is making this uh, end bulb, so you can see we can see um, from pathology in this way. So what we want to understand is that we could see the same uh, axonal damage, uh, ongoing axonal damage of the chronic active edge also in vivo, and we did this association study. So we selected um, 137 non-active MS, so stable MS people, and we look for these paramagnetic rim lesions, but also we measure serum neurofilament light chain, as a potential surrogate biomarker for ongoing axonal damage, of course. And here you can see the results. Um, actually having, again, several of these type of lesions was associated with an increase of serum neurofilament light chain per percentile, more than other factors known to affect the neurofilament uh, light chain in, in the serum. So this is uh, quite important because we know that the axonal pathology is uh, contributing and is one of probably the, ma the major contributor to clinical progression and disability. So overall, these data are um, uh, bringing us to this point, um, accelerating somehow the resolution of the chronic inflammation, this type of lesion may be beneficial, be and uh, uh, especially the resolution of the paramagnetic rim lesion, the paramagnetic rim in rim lesions, might indicate a reduction of chronic inflammation. So the question, uh, a little bit pro pro uh, provocative, is uh, should we cure APRL, uh, this paramagnetic religion, or can be cured? Um, as you can see from this uh, um, example, this type of lesions, this rim is very persistent over time, even years. And so this means that the chronic inflammation is lasting you know, several years. But if we can cure or if we should cure this type of uh, um, lesion, which, which are the measures we should use uh, and which are the implications for a clinical trial? First of all, we might want to count, uh, uh, for example, the number of this type of lesions at baseline and a follow-up after you know, giving a drug X, 
or we can measure the uh, paramagnetic room intensity, for example, implementing QSM, this is a technique uh, to quantify the susceptibility shift, or we can measure the lesion size, uh, a little bit as I showed you earlier with the cells uh, and the expanding lesions, or we can uh, measure the lesion tissue damage using uh, quantitative T1, MTR, or other type of measures uh, to understand the evolving tissue damage within this type of lesions. So to answer the, the first question, are these uh, uh, paramagnetic rim lesions really stable over time, or these type of lesions are um, dynamic? And uh, so we did a um, seven Tesla study looking longitudinally to these lesions for more than uh, up to 10 years, and these are the results. So in a subset of them, the rim uh, fade over time, so it's going away. Uh, in some, it's very stable. So in the first case, the rim is very stable, so it's not changing over time. But in the second case, you can see that the rim is disappearing over time. And we estimated the probability of survival of the rim in this type of lesion, and it was about the median PR survival of about seven years. So this is a great, uh, actually, news, because this means that this biomarker is not a brain tattoo, but it's something dynamic and is very sensitive to near their life pathology, is the iron laden microglia I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the study. So if you want, we want to use this uh, resolving rim uh, as outcome measure in uh, you know, clinical trials, for example, um, to uh, affect current inflammation in MS. Um, how we can power using the seven Tesla data we, I, I, I showed you earlier. So here I'm showing you how uh, I will do that too. So, uh, using this binary outcome measure, so a stable rim versus a fading disappearing rim, to get uh, to have 80% of power to uh, detect a 10% increased proportion of fading disappearing rims uh, by one year treatment, you will need uh, at least uh, 16 people per arm, so treated uh, by a drug X you want to test versus untreated, and at least 56 PRL per group. So you can uh, understand that uh, uh, this is quite convenient because the sample size is very small for proof of concept clinical trials. Um, and this is because the rim is very stable over a few years follow up, so one to two years. So everything is changing the rim within one or two years is very effective in reducing the iron laden microglia. So um, th this, this brings to the point about the uh, available disease modifying treatment that we are using. Are they, um, they affecting? Anyhow, the chronic inflammation and this type of biomarker. So um, in one of our studies, uh, we, uh, we look cross-sectionally and we, we saw that uh, patient treated also with a highly effective, effective treatments such as natalizumab, bucralizumab, they still have uh, some of these lesions. So um, we need to investigate a little bit more longitudinally the effect of these drugs in potentially shortening the uh, rim fading away, so the chronic inflammation going away. And uh, uh, there are, uh, to my knowledge, three studies, two published, I will show you in a moment, looking specifically for the effect of current uh, disease-modifying treatment on these uh, paramagnetic rim lesions. So this is the first one, uh, published uh, this year uh, by the group of Susan Gauthier. And they, um, they look uh, at the, is a single center, retrospective three Tesla MRI study. They are comparing the effect of glatiramer acetate and the methyl fumarate on this type of lesions. And they use as an um, outcome measure the uh, QSM. So they are looking at the changes in the susceptibility shift due, uh, so to the fading, if you want, of the rims, but quantifying using QSM. And according to the results, uh, they saw that the methyl fumarate was able to accelerate the, um, the, the rim fading. So um, the resolution of the chronic inflammation, if you want, uh, shown by this type of, of um, biomarker. Uh, looking at the individual trajectories, uh, um, however, you can see that uh, Maybe the changes uh, and the trend uh, we can see here is driven by maybe some lesions or few patients. But in any case, this is very encouraging and it's definitely worth uh, to um, replicate the study uh, using in an independent court. So this is very promising and definitely we need to follow up on this using maybe larger court of patients and larger number of, uh, of lesions. Because according to my estimation, this is a little bit underpowered 
for, for um, to look at this difference. We are uh, doing, um, so this is a second study, we, we uh, are looking for the uh, effect uh, um, of anti cd 20 um, antibody treatment, so the rituximab or crelizumab, on this type of lesions. We will present this uh, next month uh, um, at ECRIMS. And this is a multicenter retrospective study, again, three Tesla. And we, uh, uh, we, we studied 42 cases uh, treated with anti cd 20 treatment and 24 untreated MS. If we, uh, you can see that the number now of patients and uh, lesions, so we compare also PRL versus non-PRL, is a little bit higher and um, maybe more in power than the previous study. But in any case, if we are looking at the resolving PRL outcome measure, uh, we'll say that this drug is not very effective because we could see one rim disappearing but in the untreated arm. But we were not happy about this result, of course. So we look for other type of measures and the one I mentioned earlier. So we look at lesion volume, QSM, and lesion um, quantitative T1, so on the T1 map. And again, um, also with these measures, we couldn't see a clear um, treatment effect on this type of lesions. Although you can see on the lesion volumes that the PRL untreated are maybe growing, uh, you know, more than the treated PRL. So they this will be in line a little bit with the cell results, for example, but at least in our data, this uh, um, data didn't reach uh, significance. So maybe we need to enlarge the court also in this case, but for QSM and the lesion um, quantity T1, we didn't see really a great difference. And the uh, T1 was done only in one center, so we need to uh, enlarge the data, of course. So, not great hope for at least this type of, uh, in, this, uh, in this study. Another group um, uh, published recently also this study. They look at the, at the problem in a different way. So they are saying, are disease modifying treatment delaying the evolving <laughs> tissue damage associated with this type of lesions? And again, this is a, re a single center retrospective to year three Tesla MRI study. Unfortunately, it's super small and they put together treated, but treated with, you know, all kinds of treatments versus eight patients untreated and 55 total PRL. They use as a half measure the T1 to 2 ratio being used in the past for um, overall tissue damage, uh, to measure myelination in the cortex, I mean, for, for different things, but they use here to look at the um, um, lesion uh, damage, intrinsic tissue damage, and they saw some effect of uh, treatments after two years of follow-up, you can see in the graph. However, we, can, we cannot really um, say anything about the type of drug who is driving this, uh, you know, uh, this effect, because, the, I mean, the, the sample size is uh, very too small. Um, but on the same line, um, so th there is this uh, interest in using this type of biomarker for novel proof of concept clinical trials. And this is what Danny Reich at the NIH is uh, conducting in, in, in the last two years. So there are three studies going on. Uh, the first one is uh, um, actually for preventing the um, PRL formation from an acute lesion. So is maybe the less interesting for us today. The other two are, um, are using the biomarker I told you before. So to resolve this chronic uh, uh, paramagnetic rim lesion. And they're using the uh, anakinra, this is the interleukin-1 beta blocker, and uh, BTK inhibitor. These are the um, trial design. Um, this one is the first one we did, and it's all, almost uh, over. Uh, so we need to analyze the data, but it's very short, as you can see here. And it's using one arm, open label, and is using this uh, um, resolving PRL as primary outcome measure. The second uh, trial is uh, using, uh, um, the, is, a comp is 96 week, uh, six weeks, so a little bit longer, and uh, is non-randomized to harm in one, uh, the treatment harm is the rituximab, crelizumab, or fatuntumab, and the second one is one of the BTK inhibitors. So we'll see again, also in this case, uh, the, the results in the next uh, few years, but again, the primary outcome measure will be uh, the resolving RIM biomarkers. One study, um, one of the published uh, uh, phase two clinical trial, uh, 
um, look uh, as an exploratory outcomes to this type of biomarker. This is in the supplementary uh, material. And you can see that, uh, um, again, as in the demographic study I show you uh, at the beginning of the presentation, about 50% of the participant, they have at least one of these type of lesions. So again, this is confirming that it's feasible to do trials on people with this type of lesions because it's half of our population. And there was one resolve in PRL at week 72. Again, it's a very, you know, just one, but it's promising. And um, there is interest in, in using also for um, future uh, phase uh, three studies. They look also at the cell. There is a cell sub-analysis, but it, they couldn't see any difference um, in the cell volume by uh, the different dosages. And other studies are looking at this uh, uh, biomarker over time. So um, this is what uh, um, we, we are here. So looking for the effect of current uh, available treatments on this type of chronic inflammation seen with this biomarker, the proof of concept clinical trial going on. But um, we, we, were, we wanted really to look for new therapeutic targets. And for this reason, we, we did a single nucleus RNA-6 study um, and using frozen brain tissue from progressive MS cases. And we sampled the edge, the core, the periplac. This was uh, uh, MRI informed. And we did this study. I don't know if you are aware of the single nucleus RNA seq studies, but um, this map uh, is uh, showing you um, uh, nuclei. So each dot is a nucleus. And we have the full transcriptome profile for each nucleus. And nuclei with similar transcriptome profiles are um, close by and clustered into these clusters. This is an unsupervised um, clustering. So then we can annotate the name of this cluster based on uh, known lineage markers. So for example, we have the astrocytes, immune cell, lymphocytes, vascular cells, OPC, oligonerocytes, several clusters. We have a few neurons because I tried to sample the white matter, of course, but still some neurons were in the preparation as well. So um, we look for what was there at the chronic active edge. And the way we did that was to try to understand not only the critical population operating at the region edge, but also the cross talk about the different population with each other. And so we computed this glial interactome in which uh, uh, you can see the important population playing a role in, at the chronic active edge. We can immediately see the, uh, still the presence of lymphocytes, so activated T cells and plasma blasts mostly, very few number driving a sort of glial activation expansion of uh, um, the core uh, of this network is the microglia inflamed EMS we call MIMS uh, with the two phenotypes, the one reaching higher, and it is really nicely linking with our imaging biomarker. And another one is the foamy one because it upregulates um, a, a series of genes involving phagocytosis, myelin debris, and degradation, and the inflammatory astrocytes. So um, looking at this network, we uh, focus our attention to the interaction between the activity microglia and the astrocytes. And uh, we um, immediately saw the upregulation of the early complement genes involved at the chronic active edge in comparison to the, all the other areas, so the core of the lesion, the periplac, in comparison to non-neurological controls, and especially upregulation of C1Q. We, um, validated this uh, also from a uh, protein point of view. So in immunostainings and quantification, you can see that both C1Q and C3D, C3D are um, um, mostly expressed at the chronic active edge in comparison to all the other areas, a little bit also in the magnetic cortex. And to better understand why C1Q was overexpressed at the chronic active edge and the implication for the activation of microglia, we did uh, uh, two um, EAE mouse um, experiments. In the first one, we did um, a C1Q conditional lockout in the microglia. And the microglia in this animal was not able to activate uh, um, after the induction of the EAE. So that was pretty interesting. But the second experiment, uh, we used a C1Q blocking antibody and again, uh, this C1Q blocking antibody was able to reduce the ferritin positive microglia cells in a late EAE model. So, altogether, these are maybe still, uh, you know, pre preliminary data if you want, but um, we are looking for other, of course, uh, uh, targets than the conventional one. 
uh, targets that are potentially affecting the glial activity and, and potentially the crosstalk between uh, the microglia and the astrocytes. And this uh, is just an example. On the same uh, um, subject, uh, what I did was also an in silico analysis, uh, looking for microglia drug interaction. So I used the transcriptome profile of this uh, microglia the chronic active edge, and I look for non-pharmacological compounds able to inhibit this type of uh, the activity of this type of microglia. And um, these are some of the hits, and some of them are pretty interesting, and you all know about them because they've been already tested in other clinical trials in MS, but using uh, um, as outcome measure, uh, you know, conventional MRI or, you know, uh, act new active lesions or atrophy, but it would be very interesting to test them against these uh, uh, new biomarkers, so the paramagnetic rim lesions. Uh, I will, uh, you know, statins, budalast, uh, BTK inhibitors is ongoing, and there is also the opposite effect of the sex hormones, as you can see. So the estriol is inhibiting and the androsterolone is uh, activating the, the macroglia. Um, yeah, so I'm on time. Uh, take home messages. Uh, so imaging uh, these chronic active lesions using uh, the paramagnetic rim lesion biomarker. So it's uh, a biomarker for a subset of these chronic active lesions. Uh, represents to me a new window uh, of opportunity for better evaluating and monitoring the glial activity in chronic inflammation in MS for evaluating the efficacy of uh, uh, the available disease-modifying treatments we are using in treating chronic inflammation. And I show you just three studies, but I'm sure that in the next few years, uh, uh, many papers will come out on, on this topic, and also for testing new treatments and potentially new classes of treatments uh, targeting the glial activity. This uh, overall is because the accrual and the persistency of this type of lesions uh, can identify patient at risk for uh, clinical progression, and we think that this type of chronic inflammation and seen as in the chronic active lesion can be one of the factors driving, and so it can be targeted. And uh, we are using this resolving PRL biomarker as uh, uh, a novel design clinical trial. Of course, you need to design the trials differently from before, and so that's why we, we are doing this proof of concept clinical trials to learn and to then extend our the knowledge for you know phase two and phase three clinical trials. With that, I would like to thank, of course, all the people uh, who've been working on this topic over the years, collaborators, especially Danny Haik at the NIH, and uh, founding sources, of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you.